You're listening to Darling Shine, a podcast by Elodie Pullen and myself, Chloe Fisher. Darling Shine is your survival kit to the unexpected shit life throws at you. Welcome back to Darling Shine. Hi, sis. Hello. How are you? I'm I good, Muffin. You. How are you? I fucking miss you so much. It's getting a bit ridiculous. I just feel like I'm never going to see you again. I know. Luckily I for know. this, I... luckily we get to do this. Yeah, because I feel like we just get to have our little catch up. It takes us like six hours before we actually start recording because <laughs> there's so much to catch up on. We all, we, <laughs> log, we actually were meant to start at nine. It's now 11, like my time, because <laughs> we've just <laughs> fucked around talking for so long. Yeah, um, we love a good fluff around. But today's episode is all about IVF. We're going to go through like what even is IVF, the first stages of IVF, why we've done it. We're going to go through everything from like injections to pricing to support to resources for everyone. So we're going to cover a lot. I guess the whole reason about doing this episode is because I've been speaking to a lot of people lately and I honestly didn't realize that it wasn't like common knowledge what IVF was. And I know we've spoken about both of our journeys, like we've touched on it in season one, but someone I was even talking to someone the other day going oh yeah we're going to start IVF again soon and they're like what's IVF I'm like wow people actually like I'm not I'm not saying that in a rude way but people actually don't know what IVF and I feel like I personally live and breathe it every single day so it's like I know it like the back of my hand but there's actually there's people out there that are I'm really not sure and so I guess the purpose of this episode we wanted to go in and we really wanted to like pull apart all the pieces um, that make up IVF and try and explain it. And like, we're obviously not doctors, but between the two of us, yes. we both have gone through IVF. Um, so we know an, enough to hopefully um, give you guys a better understanding of what it actually yeah. is. <laughs> From our own experiences. Yeah. Also a funny one. Do you remember back in the day if like, I remember going to school and I think there was someone in our grade that was an IVF person, a baby. And I think, really? you know, people, yeah, I think so. And like that was quite rare and it was like, oh, that was, a, you know, a test tube baby like it was yeah. called. Do you remember we used to kind of. It's actually, it I so remember rare. when I was a kid, when I was a kid, I remember like that being thrown around that term at some point. Oh, yeah. that kid was grown in a test tube. Isn't that yeah. wild? Because like yes. you really thought that, that was like a foreign weird thing. And now it's so com. I mean, in our world, it's very common because everyone I speak to pretty much um is aware or knows what it is or so many of our friends do go through it as well but um well a few of them but I know what you mean when you're talking to like especially guys or like people that don't know your journey they might be like what What the fuck's IVF Mm, so today we are going to chat about it but firstly let's talk about how like Chloe when did you figure out that you needed you needed this extra help of IVF like and then I'll go through my story. Well, I guess like, I mean, to rewind a little bit, a lot of people were also asking about um, when do you know, when did you and your partners decide you actually want to start having children? And I guess that for me comes before actually going down the IVF journey. And if you ask any of our friends at school, and this is like the most heartbreaking part for me, um, which not everybody knows, but if you ask any of my girlfriends from school, I seriously have wanted a child since I was like 16 years old and like my ex-boyfriend at the time, like he knew very clearly like if we were to accidentally fall pregnant, we would have for sure, I would have wanted to keep that baby. Um, And so that for me has not, I've had no doubt in my mind that I wanted to be a mum and even more so than, you know, most of our girlfriends, like I've spoken about it for what, like years and years and years and years now and like most of our friends like no I want to do the career thing or I want to do you know I want to travel travel, or I want you know all this sort of stuff or I'm not going to be ready until I'm in my 30s and stuff like that whereas I I feel like I've been ready and wanting a child there was no deciding for me like obviously when Paul and I got together um it's not like the right time at the very beginning in everyone's in an ideal world it's not the right time to fall pregnant at the very beginning of a new relationship but if at any point in my um in my teenage years and young and my adult years if at any point I was to fall pregnant personally I would not have had an abortion and that's just me personally because I have wanted to be a mother my whole entire life and that's a no-brainer for me um but so for Paul and I I basically I was on the pill for probably since from the age of 16 to maybe about 25 and then we went off the pill and we were never really careful but 
we had never fallen pregnant. But for me personally, I didn't actually know that that was a um, – I Problem. didn't know that it was really hard to fall pregnant. I thought it was like one – I actually didn't even know that it was – well, I sort of knew that it was one time of the month, but we never really practiced safe sex and I had never fallen pregnant, but I just – it wasn't a thing. Um, until we kind of got I uh, probably like six months away from our wedding and I was like, okay, maybe I don't want to – let's try and be a little bit careful in the lead-up to the wedding because I like – I've gotten this mm. far. I might as well like go out with the bang and then let's sort of try after the wedding. Um, and then we got to the wedding and we actually fell pregnant with our first bub naturally the morning after our wedding. Um, and that was just like a miracle little baby. And like that was that was just that. Like it just like – and then I was like, oh, my God, this is so easy. Like wh- what do you know? Perfect Dream timing for me to be. Um, and then we had a miscarriage at seven weeks when we basically got back from Bali and like before we came back over to the States and stuff like that. So that was kind of the start of my journey. And then COVID hit and we came back to Australia and we were in Australia for the latter end of 2020 and we actively tried every single month. Um, I tracked my periods. I tracked my ovulation well, as best as I could. Um and it got to about actually Elodie started Elodie and Chumpy were also trying at the same time and she was also having some issues falling pregnant too. And mm. Elodie Elodie actually went to her GP and they suggested she get all these tests done. And I still remember the day that um Elodie was over for dinner and she got this phone call from the doctor saying, like, Oh, um, You've your got a really low, low, yeah, your egg count's really low. And that was really the first time I had ever heard anything about an egg count. Mm. <clears throat> and Elodie was really worried. I was like, it should be fine, like blah, blah, blah. Anyway, it was probably a month later or a few weeks later, it kind of, something just dawned on me and I was like, no, nah, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. I've been trying nearly for a year naturally. I've had not like I had a DNC after my first miscarriage. I'm meant to be cleaned out. I'm meant to be fresh. It's meant to be like easy to fall pregnant after all that, and I'm not. So let's just go in. I want to get this test done the same as L. And sure enough, it came back and my my AMH was 3.2, um, which is very low for my age. And I so guess low. that then. <clears throat> yeah, I guess that then went that sort of opened up the IVF conversation and yeah, I I I kind of went and I, I met my IVF specialist Dr. Ki Ung. Um he's in Southport on the Gold Coast and that's just been our journey ever since and that and, and there was just no right or wrong time for us. That was just how it panned out and there was not really obviously we still try naturally but natural isn't wasn't really an option for us at the time because we really wanted to be pregnant like yesterday and Mm. you think going into IVF it's like cool let's just do this and it's going to help us and we're going to be pregnant next month but it obviously hasn't panned out that way for us but yeah I that that's kind of my journey into becoming like okay with my journey into becoming like motherhood but yeah I don't know yeah I remember (laughs) Chloe when I remember just like when we're at school, but even just always growing up, like all of us girls were like, yeah, Chloe will be the first one with a kid, like you for sure will. And do you remember when we did that time capsule thing that we were like, we'll open in Mm -hmm. X amount of years? So it's now been like way more than. It's been like six years, I think. Probably six years since that. But we're all. And like in the time capsule, we were like, you know, who's who's about to have kids? Chloe, of course. Like we had to like do all these kind of like life events and how they were going to pan out. Let me fucking tell you, Chloe and I have not gone to plan at all. <laughs> oh, we're like literally oh. too scared to open the the time capsule. I don't think yeah. like it's going to have to I wait think, another five years. Well, I mean, yeah, actually, in light of Trump and everything, we were meant to open it, weren't we, when we were all together mm. at that mm. wedding and mm. I think we decided not to because it was too fucked up. Yeah, um, so talking so, of time capsules, I feel like we should do that as an activity, a darling shine activity one day, get everyone to do time capsules and we're going to write down the same questions and we'll get you guys to all put them in envelopes and hide funny. them away and we'll open it up in five years' time. <clears throat> it's so interesting because you because obviously it was all like, you know, babies, marriage, who's going to live where, who's going to travel the most, who, like, you know, where where is everyone going to be? You don't think to say like who's going to die, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I know. 
So that's why I don't like, think ours is ever going to get open. It's a I don't little know. bit scary for right no, now. I think it'll be good to open it one day. I'll be I'll be able to for sure. I mean, yeah. Um, I think when yeah. you're having a baby and when your bub's here, maybe we can open it. Yeah, um, okay. But basically like a really quick snapshot of my journey with IVF, I guess. Chump and I got together at the end of 2012. Um, we lived together straight away. Um, he was always travelling for snowboarding. I was always I was on the pill for maybe a few years, like until maybe like 2015. And then I went off the pill. I always have known something with my hormones has always been wrong. My, I've always been really prone to acne. So went off the pill, had the worst skin for years, been on and off things like Roaccutane um, and like drugs for skin. I, I think I got told once that I probably have polycystic ovaries, but never was tested properly for it. Just, I was so healthy. I've always been like really not now. All you guys ever see lately is me eating fucking McDonald's and shit. But before podcast Elodie, I was like the healthiest person ever because I was always trying to eat hormone balancing foods. I was always Googling like, you know, eat this fucking kind of seaweed because it'll be really good for your (laughs) thyroid and in turn it'll do this, blah, blah. Like I was always just a health nut. Um, so I was always trying to get my body in check just in general, like overall hormone health and gut balancing. And I always did think in the back of my mind, I've never been pregnant. I've never fallen pregnant. I've never been care. Well, once we got off the pill was never careful because we were in such a solid relationship that if we were going to fall pregnant, it wasn't even a Mm. question. Of course we'd have it. Yeah. Um, but I always had in the back of my head, I just think something is a bit wrong with my hormones and my body. And it was all stemmed from having bad skin. I just knew there was always an imbalance with me. Um, whether that was polycystic, I don't think I do have polycystic ovaries actually. Anyway, it would be, have, would have been looked into further and diagnosed by my, my, my doctor if that was the case I think it was just a chat um so yeah it definitely got to a point where we were just like going for it completely but not like let's try but just I was like weird why aren't I getting pregnant and then I think we really really started to try about it was a few months before your wedding clothes and I remember being like oh like stupid things you think of, like, but I'm going to go to Bali for Chloe's wedding and, you know, I want to drink. I don't want to be like pregnant in the dresses, like things like that. So I'm like, maybe I'll, maybe we like relax for a few months. Plus Chump was also away. So it was like, yeah. let's just chill and then like go really hard after, get back into it after Chloe's wedding That's kind of thing. That's sort of where our, our like our journeys kind of cross over as well. Cause, and they're very, yeah. very similar, but where the boys have been away and it's like yeah. we have these like little windows where we're working with like Literally. we do have, we did have that against mm. us. Yes. Definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, we had already started because pretty much when we moved up here into our house, I mean, we've got a house with like five bedrooms where we're very much set to go. We're set up for kids. This was like always the plan. So when we moved in, we got our dog and then we started just kind of going for it. But it wasn't until after Chloe's wedding that we were like, let's let's do it really properly like every morning checking mm. my temperature with the thing checking my ovulation all the time I would actually also um my doctor said you can feel when you're because so I think a lot of people might get this when you piss on this the ovulation stick um I wasn't getting very clear signs of ovulation and I was always thinking the sticks weren't working. So my doctor said, if you feel in there around that time and you feel this, your cervix and it's low and soft, like a peach would be, that means you've, you're ovulating. And if it's high up and you can't even find it or it's rock hard, you're not ovulating. So I would like literally like, I'm so obsessed with like the human body and anatomy and like feeling things like, I'd, I'm so interested in this stuff like that, that I would literally be like, oh, we're on here. I think we're on like, let's rip in, <laughs> let's rip in this week. Like this is it. Um, and yeah, so every month, obviously same thing. So disappointing when we weren't getting pregnant. Um, I ended up finding really good acupuncture pers- people up here who Chloe and I talk about all the time at Newa, Jess and Bonnie, and then in Corumban, and then um, found a really good doctor who I put you on to, Chloe, we see her, Patricia Hill um, in Eleonora. And so Patricia Hill was like, you're all normal, you're all healthy, keep trying, but let's do some tests. And that's that's maybe a week later, um, Chump and I were at your house, Chloe, I got that call to say my egg count was like 3.5 and she was like, 
you're reading as though you're like 36 or maybe even 40. Like, like she was just like, it's this way is too low that. for your. <clears throat> yeah, maybe it was way high. Maybe it was like 40 or something. Because I'm not, like, not saying I'm really, that that's I'm 30 and that, yeah. Yeah. We're not saying that higher. that's old and that you can't fall pregnant at 40 because I actually know plenty of people that fall pregnant when they're 40, you know, five. Yeah. Like, completely not saying that. But I was 27. I was 27 at the time. Mm. Yeah. And I, to hear that, I was just like, oh, so confused. But they always assure you, like, you know, you've just got a really low egg count. That's why it might take X amount of months because mm. some months you might not even have an egg that ovulates that month. And then the next month you might have one that ovulates, but that's a shit egg or not a viable mm. egg. And then the next month it might be a good egg, but that egg only comes around every few months. So it was always just going to take longer, she said, for us. But she said, if you get sick of it, she was like, try for another six months. So it would have been... It would have been end of last year, like say November. So Chump, Chump's accident happened and he passed away in July. So we just found out about two months earlier about my low egg count, I think it would have been. And then his accident happened. We were, um, yeah. And then say we would have tried for a few more months if he was still around mm. and then 100% gone into IVF. My doctor said after that we'll look into IVF, I'll set you guys up for it. So that was always I the guess plan. Like, I guess as well with you know, people that have low egg counts, it is 100% possible that you can fall pregnant naturally. Like I am a, I'm a case for that because, you know, you saw that I have fallen pregnant naturally myself, but I guess that's where like fertility assisted treatment comes in where it's like, you might only have like one opportunity or two opportunities a year when you are ovulating these eggs and you think you're ovulating every month, but you're not. So that's mm. where they, you know, IUI, IVF, ICSI, they, that's where that all comes into place because it just kind of helps you um, yes. get yeah. above. Yeah, exactly. So they'll world. look into <laughs> you, they'll look into your problem. So for us, low egg count and maybe crappy, like, like, sh- mm. like, some scrambled eggs in in amongst like the very, very good egg. Mm. I think that's what our problem is or probably maybe more so you because you have actually fallen pregnant a few times and then lost it. So, yeah. So let's start to explain IVF for dummies. Sorry if you are a specialist or something and you're listening to us, you know, we're just going to talk about it in our terms so that it's very understandable. So, Chloe, can you start with IUI? Because typically once you go to begin an IVF journey, and uh, I guess a regular couple might start to begin with IUI, which is kind of the first step. So go for it because you've done IVI before. Yes. So I guess this is like a simpler and less invasive treatment and they'll, you know, start you off there. So I guess... Um, the, your specialist will get a sample of the carefully sp- selected sperm um, and pretty much they just, it helps the sperm reach the uterus. So it's not actually like doing the work when your partner ejaculates in you and then it's got to try and find its way. Basically, you go in there, you lay back, they put a speculum in like when you have a pap smear, they open you up and then with the syringe, they put it straight into your uterus with like millions of sperm and they're just like basically squirted in there and it's up to the sperm and the egg um to do its thing together sometimes it works some for in our case didn't work um Mm. but you pretty much um it basically is giving the sperm a head start by putting it nearer to the egg but it still actually needs to reach and fertilize the egg on its own um but yeah you're still doing the some hormone treatments and some hormone injections and basically they'll monitor you through the process with ultrasounds and they'll be able to see how many follicles and how many eggs you have but if you actually overstimulate with the with the hormone injections they can cancel the treatment because they really only want you to have one or two dominant follicles because obviously if you're putting all the sperm up there and you've stimulated too many you have a high chance of multiples um yeah so it's like very tailored to each person and you, you the, the the amount of hormones, it's like much lower than doing, say, an IVF cycle. Um, yes. So, yeah, that's IUI. Okay, so I am going to explain the IVF process as well. Um, I'm going to try and do my best step by step and make it as simple as possible because it does get a little bit confusing. Um, so basically a treatment cycle will start on day one of your period. So as you really do need to be getting your periods to be able to even start IVF. So as soon as you get your period, you're all excited. You're calling up the your IVF specialist. You're going, yay, I've got my period. And then you, you'll go in, you'll do some 
blood tests, and this is day one. So basically, simply put, it is taking the eggs and the, your partner's sperm or a sperm donor, it combines them in a dish, and then it kind of lets the natural um, process occurs. It fertilizes, and then an embryo will form. But I want to just talk you through how we <clears throat> even get to that point, because it is a little bit um, confusing. And I'm going to, I've written it down so I don't miss any steps. But yeah, so basically, <laughs> Um, yeah, we, they stimulate your ovaries and that helps your body to produce the eggs. You're actually creating these eggs yourself naturally. Um, so it basically involves a series of injections or medications and your doctor will do this, a whole plan for you. My, um, my doctor gave me like a full like diary thing each day, what day it was, what medications it was. And it's very, very easy to manage. Um, the nurses basically mm. talk you through every process. If you have any issues you can call them up and they'll literally hold your hand well for me anyway they, they'll they're really great um and then they will remove those eggs in it's it, it's a simple day procedure um called the egg collection or egg retrieval i personally went under anesthetic for mine loved it love such a vibe for me anesthetic i love waking up from that <laughs> <laughs> i'm like can you please just put me to bed for a little bit longer next time they're and like you yeah you're gone so for 14 funny. minutes <laughs> um but elodie no. had hers in the chair she didn't you? you had the green yeah, whistle <laughs> i had the green whistle which also i can say is amazing i honestly felt nothing <laughs> you can feel them kind of down there but nothing hurts at all and i felt drunk i felt high it was so fun i was just having the biggest chat and i was honestly giggling up there to the point where my doctor was like can you just settle down up there like we're trying to concentrate down here (laughs) but um so yeah I wouldn't be scared if you end up at an IVF place and they're like look we only do it in the chair we don't put you under like put your hand up for that because it's a vibe yeah but yeah go on Chloe (laughs) um and then so basically on the same day if you're doing a fresh a fresh collection your partner will go into the lab um and they'll collect a sample He'll go into his little fun room. Um, oh, yeah, Fisher loved that, Paul, didn't he? Paul loved that. Not. He's just like it was a black leather chair and they had one of those puppy pee pads basically on the on the seat. <laughs> it's so sterile. Like, How do you get turned on in there? It's so gross. I know. And they had like a big plasma screen with like a porno on it for him all ready to go. <laughs> Love that. Um, but, yeah, oh, so he was just like, I need to get in and out as quick as possible because this place is fucking rank. And didn't they um, also <laughs> recognise him there? Weren't the receptionists like, Fisher, yeah. just go in and, just- and have a wank. <laughs> oh, he was like, this is so awkward. <laughs> yeah, so they did recognise him, I think. Um, I love you show can't wait to see you <laughs> and then after they're like good funny. sample bro you got heaps <laughs> of good sperms <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah pretty funny so then yeah basically they'll collect a sample of the sperm um or they will prepare the donor sample if you're using a donor or also you can have your sperm that is frozen um which in my case, when Paul was traveling, I actually did get him to do a collection and we have his sperm on ice as well, which you have to pay rent for in the freezer. Mm. Crazy. Um, and then so basically the lab prepares the samples um, and they collect the most viable sperm from the sample and then they want to combine it basically with your eggs that you, they've collected. Um, so the aim of the game is obviously to all those hormone injections, you're getting the most eggs as possible and then um, on that collection day they try they want to collect as many as they can some of them actually they can see when they're inside your is it your ovaries or your uterus I'm not sure where they're uh, looking in there but like some at some point in there um, not all of them might they might not want to take them all out so I'll just leave them and just take the good ones yeah, um, and basically fun. then the scientists will combine the culture of the eggs and the sperm in a lab and the goal is obviously to create as many embryos as possible. So the more you have, the greater chance of them becoming viable for use. So then I guess they put them all in this dish and then if the eggs fertilize, they become embryos and they'll grow for five days. And on day five, this is called blastocyst. And that is that is the aim of the game. You want mm. your little embryos to grow or your little eggs and your sperm to grow and form into blastocysts because at this point um, you can freeze them at blastocyst and then you could also have a transfer. Some people actually do opt for day three transfers or they don't have to 
necessarily get to blastocyst, mm. but by getting to blastocyst, that is their best possible chance of being in a successful pregnancy. Um, so yeah, at that point, once you kind of, you do the collection, you go home, you wait for the five days, every single day they call you with an update on like how many have survived the night. Um, and Elodie and I will talk a little bit later mm. on about how many we both had each time. And it is the most horrific wait. I remember the last time I was going through it, yeah. it was all over Mother's Day. It was Mother's Day, one of the days. And I'm like, please tell me that this little guy or girl is still there. And it was it was the one that I actually fell pregnant with and I only had one the whole way through and it, and it literally lasted the whole way. It was just the best news mm. on Mother's I actually got told on Mother's Day that it reached day five mm. blastocyst. So that was really special for me actually. Um, that was and then little- basically at that point you then go back in um, and they – transfer it into your uterus that one day five one yes and they will insert that one in at the exact time that you're ovulating and like it's literally to the minute you have to go in yeah Yeah. and then you just cross your fingers for two weeks but yeah so then um yeah if you then have additional viable embryos you can freeze them um to use it for another cycle in my case I never really got that um but then you uh, after that, you have that two-week wait, which absolutely sucks. And at this time, you either get your period or you do a blood test and you're pregnant. So that's yes. IVF in a nutshell. It's yeah. A bit confusing, but I There's hope you this... followed. Yeah, no, I think you explained that pretty well. So moving on from basic IVF, as Chloe explained, where the egg and the sperm will find itself in the in the dish and make their own embryo. ICSI is like another level where it'll work with sperm. It'll like the doctor will literally hand pick one, one perfect little sperm. Apparently it's like a perfect teardrop and they will inject that one sperm directly inside the egg, literally with like a syringe poke through the egg and um, inject it straight in so that it has its like best chance. So it's not, it's not like they're finding each other in a dish. And this, in my case, Chloe's actually tried ICSI as well with Fisher's sperm. In my case, we needed this, of course, because Chumpy's sperm was not ejaculated because we um, did that sperm retrieval process, um, of course, because Chump passed away to get his sperm. So we, the doctor did hand select like the best viable sperm out of the millions and pop it straight into the egg. So thankfully that worked for me. Um, And then... They still wait for the egg to multiply and multiply and multiply and all the cells to multiply and reach that day five blastocyst stage and they will put that inside me. So that's, yeah, so that's basically the ICSI process in a nutshell. Um, I've also heard they do do ICSI for, they, they do ICSI for a number of reasons um, just to do with the male the male sperm and male fertility as well. And it's it's also something they will try if IVF. Like I think they just try all three IUI, IVF, uh, ICSI. It's just like all under the IVF bra- bracket umbrella. Yeah, it's funny because I've had ICSI both times and I'm always like, yeah, IVF. But it's yeah, different. but it's but kind it's, of I a different it's just form. like an umbrella term. Yeah, I think it is. I mean, most people are like, I don't say I had ICSI, I just say I did IVF. Like it's just a type yeah, of yeah. a different type totally. of IVF. Totally. So let's totally. talk about pricing. I think people love, like I want to tell everyone, and I didn't, I didn't have the opportunity to do it this way because of everything, but you can actually do IVF through, you need to talk to your doctor, but you can do it through the government and it's like a fraction of the price. So, I mean, Chloe and I probably paid something like, I think it's like 12 grand per round of IVF. Um, roughly, give or take. Roughly. And, and then, then medications. You, yeah, medication on top of that's a grand or two. Medicare in Australia, Medicare gives you back about seven grand. So I guess it ends up being around six, seven grand for the whole round. And that's with your egg, egg collection and everything. Um, now, if you do get a good good egg collection and you get some eggs on ice to use for your second round, if your first round is unsuccessful, your next round is going to be cheaper because you don't have to go through all the egg stimulation and the egg collection again. So, oh, my but when second- Elodie's saying egg count, Elodie's saying egg count, that's day five blastocyst. So basically, like, yes, if I it doesn't mean if you just get like ten eggs out, that's the ten eggs. If they actually have to make it to day five, and then they can be frozen, which and then you don't have to do all the needles and injections and all that again for the next round. You just got them as backup. 
Yes, I'm, and I mean when I say frozen, I mean the embryos, so not the eggs. Yes, the embryo is yes. when the sperm and the egg has created a little baby, and those are going on ice. Sorry yes. if I accidentally said egg. So then, for your next round, if your first round is unsuccessful, you've already got those embryos on ice, so they yes. can go straight in. Um, and obviously, that second round will be cheaper. Now, for Chloe, you did have to pay the full whack both times. Um, mm-hmm. But, three times. <laughs> yeah, three the three times. So there is the cheaper option if you if you want to start out, like you can start with IV, IV, IUI and, and you can actually just do IVF through the government and it's I hear it's about a grand or two grand per round. So, I mean, it's more. I don't um, know how to find that. Where do they find that information? I've just heard from friends. Okay. Some of our friends oh, okay. have done it. Um. Yeah. But yeah, so obviously don't quote us on that. This is something you guys need to talk to your doctors about if you want to do IVF and and you maybe don't have the funds or the health insurance. Go through the government and do it that way. I think the process is a little bit more different because the doctor's not working directly with you. You might have a different doctor each time or different nurses. But I mean, plenty of people do it this way. It's a lot cheaper. Um, so because I think a lot of people just go, oh, IVF, like can't afford that um, or, yeah. you know. So look into the government IVF pricing. And I guess as well, another thing that I wanted to touch on and a lot of people have asked this as well is the support through IVF because obviously listening to me, it is an absolutely punishing process. Mm. You think that you're just going to do IVF and you're going to get gifted a beautiful baby and it doesn't, it's not always sunshine and rainbows. For Mm. me, it hasn't been. For some people, they are lucky and it does work first time. But for others, it is probably one of the most grueling um, journeys like that you can ever go on in life. It really is. It has been has been the most traumatic, emotional, stressful, depressing, like everything. I've I've I I go through this roller coaster, and so. Mm. But I mean, listening to this podcast right now, this episode, I hope that you guys have learned a lot about the process, and it's just it's not just like a one day thing, and you just pop no. it in. It is like. People that are going through IVF are dealing with this every single day. Um, so, but you don't really have the support that you that you'd really like, especially for us being young. Not many of our friends have gone through IVF or understand IVF. I mean, most of our friends now, since us going through it and us explaining to them like a lot what we're yeah. going through, no one would know. And just the same as us, two years ago, we would not have known this ourselves. But basically what's helped me the most is there's, there's so many Facebook groups um, for IVF support and there's thousands and thousands and thousands of women that are going through the same thing. Mm. Um, just to name a few, there's a few. I think it's IVF Support Group Queensland, Australia. That's obviously the state that I'm in uh, well, that I am from. I live in um, and then there's just like IVF support group IVF warriors IUI and IVF support I'm in my my doctor's one as well Dr. Ki Ung support group there's so many and I like honestly every single day there's all these women that post about their journeys and like mm. what they've been through and it really really does make you not feel like you're in this alone um, and you read about other people and you're like oh my god I've actually gone through that as well so that is something that I can definitely say has helped me. And then also there's a lot of books um, that I've read. I mean, it's really hard one because I, I mean, I actually read the one called Awakening Fertility. Our acupuncture girls gave me that when I, w- I was like in the thick of it. And then there's also one called It Starts With an Egg, which I loved. Um, that one has probably been the most informative one for me throughout the fertility journey it like talks Mm. you through everything it's it's amazing I can highly recommend that book and then there's also one which is like really frustrating for me because it goes through like the weeks of the pregnancy and it's this big thick Mm. book it's so cool it's called up the duff um all like pictures and it talks through like your weeks of pregnancy and I've literally only got to be able to read it to seven weeks each time and I have to like put the book away back in the cupboard close the door Mm. um also, like the baby journey books, which I, I gifted Ellie one, I've like, I've given up buying those things now because I've walked through them and I've literally, 
No, the journaling ones where you can journal about oh. your weeks of your pregnancy. I've yes. done two of that and it like obviously hasn't gone, ha- haven't followed through with the pregnancy so I just, they're, they're a bit well, frustrating for I'm me. I'm going to give you so many books when you fall pregnant and you're going to journal the shit out of that pregnancy. But I'll give them to <laughs> yeah. you after after seven weeks so we can start yeah. from where we left off. Yes, it's not lucky number seven for me. Yeah, no, fuck number seven. Frozen Hope is another book. Um, oh, I've not heard of that. Yeah, one. Yeah, Frozen Hope. I've got that one here. I uh, can't say I've read the whole thing, but I've read. I've <laughs> gone into snippets. Um, but yeah, movies. So Tahina McManus's documentary, the Mum documentary, Misunderstandings of Miscarriage, is amazing. We watched. We've watched it a few times. I've watched it multiple times. There's so many resources out there. If you if you need to not feel alone during your IVF journey, on it. To be honest. I had so much going on during my IVF journey that it was just like just one of the things that I was going through. So I didn't actually like Chloe was so good at at joining all the Facebook communities and talking to everyone. And I think that really, really, really helped you. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, those resources are awesome. It is just the most foreign process ever. Like you literally you when you go to the chemist, you pick up all of these drugs. You come home. I've got this photo. I think you do, too, of you. We should Mm. put them up with like full on massive bags on either hand, like freezer bags full of syringes and drugs. And you come home and you're like, fuck, this is just so clinical and weird. And you've just got to start this two week journey where you're injecting hormones into your belly every day. And in Chloe's case, you were doing like six different ones per Mm. day. I mean, I was doing two, you were doing so many more. Yeah. And it is just the most foreign, bizarre process. Um, Lots of people will not be able to fathom in injecting themselves in the belly. So you actually can go to your doctor or to the nurses at your IVF clinic each day, apparently for them to do it at a certain time each day, if you feel more comfortable to do that. Um, but yeah, like Chloe said before, the nurses, literally, they do give you this calendar at each time every day. You've got to do this. You've got to do this. Like it's mapped out. They're amazing. They're always on call. Well, I found, I found mine, I found mine were awesome at coaching me through like every little step. So although it is super, it seems super overwhelming and it is, you you have help like the whole way through mm. um, yeah. just from, yeah, your clinic. But obviously online you'll find way more support as well. Yeah. They also do ultrasounds and all that sort of stuff all the way through as well. So they're really heavily monitoring you. Yes. Got to touch on that. I hope um, that you guys are following on from this and we haven't lost you. Ten points if you're still here. Yeah, <laughs> I feel like it's it's it is because it is such a mammoth thing and there's so many little tears to IVF. So it is can be so confusing. But do should we go through dot points of like how what happened to you each round, Chloe? Yeah. We actually we had a few people asking about both of Elodie's and my um each of our rounds, how many were collected. Um, So my very first round I did was in January of this year. And basically we, it was actually the same time as Elodie's second round. Um, So they collected five follicles. They act, I had five follicles and then when they went in five um, eggs were actually collected. Now five is pretty low. Most, a lot of people are getting like in the tens, in the twenties, in the thirties, but at the end of the day, you only need like it only takes one. So I was kind of mm. like keeping my hope on that. I was hoping for quality, not quantity. Um, but yes, yeah, so five were collected, and then out of the five that were collected, only four of them were viable enough to be inseminated with the sperm. So then, two, what did we? Where did we get to? Then they grow, those four grew for five days and we pretty much lost all of them except for two. Um, We only had one that made it to blastocyst that first round and we actually opted to freeze that one. And then we had it one that was like not quite at blastocyst and they asked me if they wanted to um, put that in and hope that it further develops because it's still reaching all of its milestones but it didn't quite make it to where it needed to be on day five so they're like let's pop it in let's hope that your uterus is like really juicy and like ready to go and like it just continues to develop and then it Mm. it implants but unfortunately for me that one it actually showed as like 
it really did. Show, it actually showed as positive right towards the end. I did a pregnancy test early, but it obviously ended as a chemical pregnancy and we lost that one. Um, and then I had the mis. I lost the baby or the, the embryo when I was in Sydney. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to go straight into another IVF round because as soon as you get your period, you need to go straight into your um your fertility specialist and then you start obviously your next cycle as soon as you get your period on day one or two. So I was in Sydney and I couldn't do that. The only other option that I had that month was to do an IUI and that kind of was able to be started on day four of my cycle. So I came back from Sydney and we did that IUI um, process where they got poor sperm and they basically, I still did um, some medications that month. I did a trigger shot, which makes me ovulate at 36 hours later, I'm on the chair, Paul has done his collection and they basically, they wash all the sperm, they get the best ones out and they put it in my uterus and then they hope that they, I think I had, I actually had two um, eggs, I ovulated two eggs that month so those sperm had two opportunities to do what they were meant to do and none of those worked. So that was my second sort of like round of that. The third month, so this is, January, February. This is in March. My doctor was like, I think we need to take a month off. We really need to work on your egg quality um, and quantity. I'm going to give you some medication, additional medication to do in this month off. So I was taking melatonin at night, which is meant to help with your egg quality. I was using testosterone cream, which I was rubbing on the insides of my arms of an evening as well. And I was also doing human growth hormone injections through this whole month to try and like really get these eggs, the quality better for the following month. So then I got my period just like, and like, it just felt like a waste of time for me, but I was really hoping to get these like good, multiple good eggs. So then I went into another another round of IVF ICSI. It was actually ICSI this round. Um, Paul was away. I did this by myself with Elodie and my mum. And this was in January, February, March. This was in April. And that time round we got 10. They found they were, they, they, there was 10 follicles, which was epic. I was like, oh, my God, this worked. I had this month off. Mm. Unreal. Um, they went in, they collected nine of the eggs out of the follicles and then there was only six were able to be inseminated with the sperm because they were the only good ones. And they literally called me up, I still remember this, they called me up the next day to give me an update of my little um, eggs mm. and we lost five in the first night of the six. And I remember mm. Elodie was over and I just like bawled my eyes out. I'm like, really Mm. come on so the one that I had left that little one lasted all the way to the end they called me every day they're like it's a keeper it's a keeper it's a keeper day five was mother's day it was blastocyst they're like this baby's going in so they put that one in and that one is the one that I had the successful pregnancy on and then I sadly lost Um, it was actually a boy we found out I sadly lost him at seven weeks again I heard the heartbeat and then a few days later I had really bad bleeding and I lost that little guy so that is Mm. pretty it's actually really sad talking about it Um, that was because that egg was such a trooper yeah I know yeah um I just remember, I just remember us hanging on to that little egg, like we were like, it's got to make it to blastocyst, and it was this perfect A grade egg. I remember we'd look, you printed Mm -hmm. like the picture of the embryo off, and we're like, this is inside you right now. We had like Mm -hmm. the little shrine of the positive pregnancy test, the crystals, the embryo sitting there on your kitchen. Um, And Elodie, Elodie had, um, Elodie was already pregnant at this point and I like bought the baby, these two, my baby and her baby, like these two matching outfits and everything. It was pretty, pretty sweet. But yeah, unfortunately it ended for me and Paul and yeah, here we are still fucking trying. That Um, was, but yeah, anyway, let's go on to you. Um. I think, I think there's a lot of things I haven't spoken about. So this is going to be like, yeah, I will go into a few things that um, no one would know. Um, So obviously Chumpy passed away in December, uh, December, July, last July on the 8th of July. 
2020. I, I, of course, in all of the shock, was so hopeful that I was pregnant. So I had a little piece of chump to, you know, keep me going and keep him going. Um, I think everyone around me knew I was trying. So we just hoped to God, God that I was pregnant that month. And of course I wasn't, my period came early cause I was so stressed. Um, I went, my brother and I went down to Sydney cause my dad shortly after got diagnosed with terminal cancer. So we went down to Sydney and because of COVID, we got stuck down there for a, th- for a few months. Um, of course I was just in a massive grief state. I was barely in my body. Um, there was just so much going on, so many people around me, every my all my family and friends from Sydney. It was just all a lot. But um yeah, I was just I was just trying to get by. I was drinking a lot. Um I had in the back of my head my my thing was we've got chumpy sperm. I will try for a baby. I'm stuck in Sydney right now, but as soon as I get home to the Gold Coast, that's the plan. So Basically, I had to do a bunch of counselling throughout this period to tick a bunch of boxes because I guess it would probably be the same if you're um, a single lady and you'd like to have a baby. You've got to get like a sperm donor and you've got to have have a baby by yourself if, if that's the journey you want to take. You, there's there's counselling you need to you know undergo so that there's boxes that can be ticked to say that you're bringing a child into the world without a dad. How are you going to have those conversations with that? that kid about this and that like how are you going to cope how are you going to do pregnancy birth and motherhood alone so I was doing a bunch of counseling sessions knowing that this this road was ahead of me and I didn't know how soon it was but I knew that I didn't want to waste time and I wanted to just do it as soon as I got put back to the Gold Coast so I remember driving from Sydney to the Gold Coast and I had to stop just after Newcastle to have my last Zoom meeting with this lady, this counsellor, and we were zooming on the highway, on the side of the highway. And of course, yeah, asking me the question, so how are you going to, are you going to tell the kid about its dad or are you, uh, are you not? What what are you going to do when it's asking where's its dad? Things like that. And such a, such a triggering process. And of course, of course, going into this, I know everything that I'm about, like I've chosen to do this. So I am ready. Mm -hmm. And I was ready for all this counselling and all these questions. None nothing here was a light decision of course this is massive this is the biggest thing I'll ever do in my life and I'm doing it alone so I'm very well prepared and yeah there was there was a big process for this and I had an appointment booked two days later with my IVF guy um because my period was coming so this was kind of crunch time I was heading back to the Gold Coast the borders had opened um had my last session with the counselor I was all ticked off and ready to go um, my IVF guy, yeah, then literally it just all happened. That's the thing with IVF, I think. Obviously, it's such a drawn out slow process because it's month by month. But once you go in for your appointment, you can essentially start at the time you next get your period. So although I'd already spoken to my IVF guy, like it was the balls were already in the mo- in motion. My period was falling that December, early December, and we had our maybe maybe that was like our second appointment because I'd met with him after he retrieved my partner's chumpy sperm um, months before. But no, he was like, all right, great. Well, you've got your period. Let's start your hormones immediately. Let's go. So then we had our egg collection. As I said, I did it in the chair and that was great. Um, The first egg collection, although I had about 14, maybe 12 to 14 good follicles on my ovaries that they could see, when they went in to do the collection, they ended up taking just eight out because I think after going in, like Chloe mentioned earlier, eight seemed to be like plumpy eggs and some didn't seem to be like big enough. So they got eight out, which we were kind of, I think we were really happy with actually. Mm. And then yeah. I love from the- say we. I was like, yeah. We'll really <laughs> yeah, <that>. we. <laughs> Me, you and Rummy. Who's we? <laughs> Me, myself and I. Love it. Uh, you and I. And then from the eight, um, five they ended up in I think they ended up inseminating five five. because uh, maybe three didn't look that good out out of I'm not sure end up five ended up being fertilized but only three made it to blastocyst so as Chloe said before they've got to last to the five days so we lost two along the way but then we had three good embryos at day five that had the cells had multiplied perfectly and they were happy with um my first round at the end of mid-December happened they shot one of the eggs the embryos up on when I was ovulating um that one 
I actually lost on New Year's Eve. I was in Hat Head with my friends um, at a holiday house and that night, yeah, it was New Year's Eve. We're about to just like go hang out and just like have a fire. It was, it's very cruisy. Nothing happens in Hat Head. And, yeah, I, I went to the bathroom and saw blood came out and I was just hoping that it was maybe implantation bleeding and not what I thought it was, even though my gut was telling me it was definitely that I was losing this this little egg just basically wasn't taking um this little egg wasn't implanting and we we started to call it yes. the eggplant do you remember is it egg planting <laughs> yet <laughs> so um so that egg didn't eggplant in my language um and yeah so new year's day I remember just being the worst fucking day for me I just I woke up so sad I was like a new year started chumpy's not here I've lost the baby the baby never took but yeah it didn't take and I was bleeding and it was just so bad I remember on my way home from Hathead calling Lauren I was like I've lost it I'm bleeding and she was like I'm pregnant and I was like oh my god what the fuck so I was like happy sad happy sad it was the weirdest thing but she was we were both just shook and um anyway so in February I thought let's just go again. I like I I just have to keep going. That's my thing. I can't mm. stop. Once I stop, mm. it, it just it's all too hard. I have to keep moving. So I wanted to keep going. In February, my doctor decided that my hormones were a bit too crazy and I needed a month off. So sorry, that was January. In January, we decided my hormones were a bit crazy. So let's wait till Feb. So in February, we took one of the frozen eggs and they did a trigger injection. Went for me to ovulate and they put one of those frozen eggs inside me and this is the one that I'm pregnant with right now and I'm about to give birth to so yes this is a good little egg and I'm so grateful and I know it's so it's almost like unheard of for it to work on the second round and I'm so 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 beyond grateful I've honestly only heard of one maybe two cases where someone's been pregnant on their first their first round of IVF which is so lucky so I feel honestly so I have I'm a feeling so that grateful. this little I have a feeling this little baby is not going to wait around for this episode so we're probably going to have a baby before, <laughs> the, before this episode yes. comes out when you're listening to this we're definitely <laughs> so, going to have a bub here um so yeah in <laughs> saying that I've also got that third embryo that's in the freezer and I can use that so at a later date if I wanted to in a few years have another another little chumpy, I can go and use that egg. And what's funny is that because the egg inside me right now that I'm about to give birth to and this other embryo will technically be kind of like twins because they're from the same collection. They're fertilized at the same time. And then like, but say that I'll have it like, you know, say if I was to go and use that egg in a few years. Yeah, they're essentially twins. Well, definitely non-identical twins, but they're from the same (laughs) pod. So how weird is that? But I could wow. also opt to have a whole new collection if I wanted a, you know, if I didn't want to have a twin or something. Um, not That doesn't mean yeah, they're going to look that. the same. But, yeah, I mean, I would obviously use that embryo, but there is opportunity for me to go and have a whole other egg collection because we do still have chumpy sperm frozen um, and in storage. So we can always do more, which is pretty cool. But to be honest, I am just – beyond grateful and feel so lucky to have this one inside me now and I do not take that lightly that that worked out so um so quickly for me and I remember when it went in I remember thinking I remember feeling like it's a girl and I still at this point don't know the sex but once you hear this I'm sure you're gonna have I'm sure I will have announced that I've had a baby and will know the sex but yeah I really thought as soon as it went in this is a girl and I think this is the one so I don't know, but, mm, you know, so we have cute. these gut fillings all the time and they do and don't work out. So I guess in a nutshell, that is my journey. And my doctor, I I remember going in to meet him for the first time and, you know, he is absolutely lovely. Um, but, you know, like doctors are just, doctors are so, so like, I'm so like blase and I need everything in simpleton terms and doctors are so like so mighty sometimes and just like they speak these words and I'm just like wow my whole you've collected chump sperm you're about to deliver me a baby I was like you better deliver me a baby my life just essentially felt like it was just so in this guy's hands and yeah so far it's just I've had a really good journey with IVF and 
I've I yeah I, I really do recommend it basically to wrap up my my journey I, I definitely recommend it if you're looking at it please don't be afraid yes it is overwhelming yes the injections seem daunting but you'll do one or two and you'll you yeah. honestly you get used to it please take the plunge if that is an option for you is what I want to say yeah yeah seriously I'm like I mean I I wouldn't I know obviously I haven't got a baby in the end of it but I actually wouldn't um give back the journey that I've been on because I I feel like I've learned so much about myself I'm actually I think that I'm like a different person to what I was two years ago for sure um and in a in a good way like I've evolved I've learned about the female body I've like Mm. learned about our reproductive system our hormones and I just feel like I've got a lot more gratitude and I'm, I'm I'm much more grateful for the little things in life now than, you know, think taking things for granted because totally. um, I certainly do do that anymore. Um, but I guess we've waffled on so much on this in this episode. We hope that you have enjoyed it. I get, if you want any more information, ivf.com.au is amazing. It's got so much, so many um, resources and information that can help you and it can give you in more like clinical terms than our layman terms. We like it that way <laughs> though. We don't want yes, you guys thinking do. you're coming to get like fucking educated by scholars, <laughs> professors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, darlings, well, anyway, that wraps us up. Thank you so much for listening. We'll speak See to you, you guys next week. week. Bye. Bye. Bye.